Grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus. Amen. But what about you? Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overpower it. Dear friends in Christ, in America, and especially in this part of America, virtually everyone has heard the name Jesus. And in fact, I'm sure almost everyone in this area has an opinion about who Jesus actually is. So did many in Galilee and in Judea as Jesus conducted his ministry on earth. When Jesus asked his disciples what the word on the street was about who he is, they had a whole list of of opinions they had heard to relate. Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Now those particular opinions about Jesus were not necessarily negative. At least the ones the disciples mentioned. We hear in the Gospels that others called Jesus Beelzebub and in league with the devil just as there are those who curse Jesus today. But these ideas that people in Jesus' day had about him and who he was were still fairly weird answers, if you think about it. John the Baptist, who'd been beheaded? Had God ever, in the entire history of the Bible, ever raised a preacher from the dead shortly after he'd been killed? No. Jeremiah? Does it say anywhere in the Bible that Jeremiah is someday going to come back from the dead? No. Strange opinions they had. Weird, I guess. The only one that has a tiny little bit of you're getting warmer to it was the Elijah one because Malachi had said that when John the Baptist comes, he would be a new Elijah. But again, he hadn't said that about the Christ, but about his forerunner. Of all the folks in our area who have formed an opinion about who Jesus is, some of them know the correct answer, the one that Peter is about to give to Jesus. Others have more confusion in what they think about Jesus and don't necessarily realize that they have an okay, an, a confused idea. A number of others think of Jesus as kind of a second Moses. He came to tell us how we should live, what we should do. You know, Moses gave the Ten Commandments. Jesus told us how we should also live. And then, of course, I'm sure we've got a smattering of people in the area that have some really weird idea about Jesus they picked up off of the History Channel. That wouldn't do for Jesus' 12 apostles. Jesus wanted to make sure that his apostles knew exactly who he is and why he came. So he asked them, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter's confession was short and sweet. He'd certainly learn and one day write and teach a whole lot more than that short sentence about exactly who Jesus is. But in this confession, Peter hit the nail right on the head. The main thing that Jesus wanted every Jew to know, namely that Jesus 
is a prophet, but certainly not just a prophet. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the one foretold by all the prophets, the one God promised to send to crush the serpent's head, the one Isaiah meant when he wrote, Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. In our Sunday Bible class a couple of weeks ago, Professor Meyer called Peter's statement the very first creed. And you can see why if you remember how the Christian church got its start. Jews in synagogues came to believe that Jesus is the one promised in the Bible. That he is in fact the Messiah. And so they would ask other Jews, who do you believe Jesus is? Do you believe Jesus is the Christ that is the Messiah? Yeah, I also see that Jesus fulfills these prophecies. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of David, the one who's coming to rescue us and give us eternal freedom. You've seen the fish symbol on the back of people's cars. That ancient Christian symbol comes from that early creed. That Greek word, ichthus, is an acronym. If you take each of the letters, Yoda is Jesus, He is Christus, Christ. Hios the U, Son of God, Soter, Savior, ichthus. Peter didn't stop either at just you are the Christ, but he also continued the son of the living God. Two weeks ago, we watched Peter plunge into the depths of the Sea of Galilee when he took his eyes off of Jesus, and Jesus expressed his disappointment in Peter, asking, why do you have such a tiny faith? Then last week, in front of Peter, Jesus commended the Syrophoenician woman. Woman, you have great faith. Now, finally, Jesus can offer Peter a compliment as well. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. You're blessed because you finally get it. Blessed because you have saving faith in the Son of God. Blessed because this faith is in fact a blessing from God. Not something you came up with on your own. You are blessed, Peter. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. It's true. Exactly what we learned in the Catechism. I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, my own thinking or choosing, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overpower it. Listen closely to that verse. Who is it that builds the church? I will, says Jesus. Yes, he uses us as his instruments, but he is the one who does the building. As his instruments, as a congregation of Jesus' people, we want to do everything we can to get God's word out so that Jesus can build the church. Tomorrow we start a new Bible information class, for example. Tuesdays we bring the word to people in Joplin. Wednesdays we bring God's word to people who will never ever be able to give a dollar to our congregation, but who are close to meeting their maker and are hearing and learning 
that Jesus is their Savior, and the Savior is bringing them into his fold. Christ will build his church. Jesus is building the invisible church as we share God's word with people. Those, those folks, those ladies and gentlemen over at Maple Tree can answer, why should I let you into my heaven when they get to the gates? They can answer because Jesus was perfect in my place, because Jesus has washed all my sins away. And as individuals, I hope each and every one of you don't chicken out, but have the courage to invite people you know to trust in Jesus as their Savior, or at least to invite them to a Bible class or a church service, because through the word, Christ says, I will build my church, that is, the Holy Christian Church, the gathering of believers in Christ as Savior. But note this, not only is Christ the builder, it's also his church that he's building. So what is Jesus' church? What is Jesus' church? Well, it's not a building. It's also not a synod. Although those can be useful things, Jesus' church is the communion of saints. It's those individuals who gather around him and confess with Peter, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. It is that confession that Jesus called the rock on which his church is built. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul expands on that definition a little when he says Christ is the cornerstone and the scriptures are the foundation. You are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. If the church is to be true and solid, it must be built on solid truth. That rock that is Jesus Christ and the correct confession of his name. What is, after all, the whole Great Commission? You remember it? Can you recite it? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe everything whatsoever I have commanded you and surely I am with you always to the end of the age. The prophetic and apostolic foundation on which Jesus builds his church is the Bible, the whole Bible, Old and New Testaments, which the apostles and prophets wrote by inspiration. Every word in the Bible is from God, and therefore every word is essential and important. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness. And the Apostle Paul even further clarifies how important this everything is in Romans 16. Now I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause dissensions and obstacles contrary to the doctrine you have learned. Avoid them. For such people do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. They deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting with smooth talk and flattering words. If we think it is our church to build, then it's very tempting to try to build on something other than the rock, or to try to build only on certain parts of the rock, or partway on the rock, and to skip the harder teachings of the Bible. 
the doctrine of church fellowship, the roles of man and woman, the real presence of Christ's body and blood in the Lord's Supper, infant baptism, six-day creation. There are teachings in every single chapter of the basic Bible Christianity course that we are starting tomorrow night that are offensive not only to unbelievers, but to lots of folks who consider themselves good Bible Belt people. We want to be part of the church that Jesus builds, his church, therefore we will stick to and stand with both feet on the rock and the apostolic and prophetic foundation. Finally, Jesus tells us exactly how he goes about building his church. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The ministry of the keys is proclaiming God's law and his gospel in Christ's name. In other words, calling people one by one individually, not to be part of a group or something like that, but to repent of their sins, both the ones they inherited when they were born and the ones that they continue to commit day by day, and then individually offering people forgiveness in Jesus' name. That is how Christ builds his church, and that's where we fit in. The Augsburg Confession says, to obtain such faith, God instituted the office of the ministry. That is, he provided the gospel and the sacraments. Through these, as through means, he gives the Holy Spirit who works faith when and where he pleases in those who hear the gospel. And the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, Therefore, since we have this ministry as a result of the mercy shown us, we are not discouraged. On the contrary, we have renounced shameful, underhanded methods. We do not operate in a deceitful way, and we do not distort the word of God. Instead, by proclaiming the truth clearly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled among those who are perishing. In the case of those people, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from clearly seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is God's image. Indeed, we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. What a comforting thing it is to Christians to know that the church is Christ's church, and to know that he is the one who builds it when and where he wills. What a further comfort to know that Christ truly is our sure, solid, unmovable rock and redeemer. As we sang, church buildings fall and steeples crash, crumbled, have spires in every land. But the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, will not fall. It is built on the rock and the gates of hell will not overpower it. Amen.